Welcome back to another episode of the Course Creation Incubator. I'm Gina Onativia, your course coach and digital strategist, here to help you get your course done and out to market and help you build the course-based business of your dreams. Now, we talk quite a bit about putting your course out to market on this show. And what exactly does an enticing offer look like for you and for your potential students? I'm also here to push you to potentially put out an offer and maybe even a smaller offer. Like we've talked lately about trialing a workshop or a smaller course a couple of episodes ago, potentially going to market when you're not 100% ready, just getting yourself out there which is exactly why it's great timing to bring on my new friend, Tony Beish, who helps busy women build and scale their high ticket memberships without all of the sacrifice. You gotta love that. And like me, she left corporate so she could help you build the business of your dreams. I wanted Tony on to talk about how different offers can take shape. What holds us back as course creators? and two extremes that we often see with course creators who are maybe waiting too long or are jumping in too soon in terms of putting their course out there. Tony has some amazing advice to consider before you launch your online course, so let's listen in. Tony, welcome to the show. So amazing to have you on. Thank you so much for having me, Gina. I'm so excited to be here. So we're talking about something that's so important for my course creators, which is making offers, right? Getting yourself out there and specifically the life cycle of your offer. And I want to make sure first and foremost, we're all on the same page. Talk to us about where an offer begins. For me, an offer begins like at the very first touch point that a person has with you and your business. And I'm not saying it's like you're asking them to marry you on their first date. It's not like, hi, here's my offer. But <laughs> the offer is like a nurture, like, hi, marry me. Um, but it's it's not like that. But it's it's a it's a nurturing process. And part of the offer, part of what they're buying is you and your knowledge and your expertise and your talents and your personality. So you've got to be thinking about it. Like at that very first point, how am I going to make them want my offer at the point where I say, hey, want my offer? Do you feel like we make, we wait too long to make offers or we just jump out there? Like, what are you finding? I find that that there seems to be those two extremes where people yes. like they, they do the whole, like, it's like they swiped right on Twinder, Tinder and they were like, marry me. Or they're, they're like, let's date for 10 years before we ever ask to they get wait like, and wait. Yeah. Yes. And I feel like there's those two extremes. And in reality, like the, the secret sauce is right in the middle. Right. And mm -hmm. And I think sometimes like it's good to make an offer early because there's some people that they're like, I'm all in, you know, instead of taking the the staircase, I like to think of offers as like a staircase. Instead of taking the staircase, I'm going to take the elevator straight to the top. There's some people that are ready right now, but there's a lot of people that aren't and they're going to be a little bit slower on the stairs, but we're not trying to get to the top of the Empire State Building. You know, we're just trying to get them to the next floor of the building so we don't have to wait too long. And, and how do you know when you're ready, right? So I know you're a believer in courses and you've everyone's an expert if you're listening right now, but how do you know when it's time to really put that offer out there? Ask your people. Like, I think if yeah. you're, if you're not sure, like sometimes you just know, or sometimes you're like, I'm just going to test it and try it. Um, but I'm a big fan of like, I don't love it when people spend all of this time creating the offer before they know if there's people that want the offer. So I'm a massive fan of ask your audience. I'm thinking about doing blah. And it's a little bit overused because I think it's a bit of a marketing tactic. Like I've already got it created, but I'm going to say I'm thinking about this to build up this scarcity and urgency. But I think if you have that genuine relationship with your people, like ask them like, hey, I'm thinking about doing this. Is that something you'd be interested in? Because I don't want to invest the time, energy and effort doing it if it's not going to serve you. And ideally, I'm here to serve you. So ask your people and ask your existing people, ask your audience. It, it, that's the easiest way to find out if they're ready. And, and where do you lie in the great debate about uh, making an offer before the course is created, right? Like how, how, how do you, right? It's a great debate. Di different people feel different ways. So what do you think about that? 
I'm team sell it before it's ready. <laughs> so I, you know, look, I, I think, and my rationale is I'm not for putting out poor quality courses. Like I want to be really clear about that. What you put out is, has to be quality, but what I see way too often is people spending so much time perfecting their course. Like I, I won't, I won't out them because they, they might listen one day, but I see um, like a health allied health professional who's been talking to me for like a year about this idea that he has for an online course. And he kind of just keeps talking about it and talking about it. And he, like, he's like, maybe in 12 months I could like, and I'm like, you know, you like, just, just get it done. Like if you put it out there, people would buy. And I think there's a real beauty when you do a little bit of a dirty beta and you're really transparent with people and saying, Hey, we're co-creating this together because I want to make sure this serves you best. So I don't want to create it in a vacuum. I want to actually create it together with you to make sure it serves you best. So I'm not for sell it and then deliver something crappy because you're just trying to make the money, but I'm for sell it. So you're aware that there's an audience sell it. So it forces you to take action and stop that procrastination cycle, sell it so that you can get going and get input from your ideal customers on what they want, but then deliver something amazing and relaunch and relaunch and relaunch. Oh yeah. We are a hundred percent aligned and I love dirty beta. That's like uh, kind of sexy and just kind of wrong at the same time. So I love it. Uh, I, I, I wholeheartedly agree. Like I'd rather we talk about done is better than perfect all the time. And a lot of times we wait too long. Like I think out of those two camps, right? Like hurry to market versus wait too long. I would say there's more people in that wait too long. Yeah. So what do you like to, what do you like to see in a dirty beta? Tell me like, what are some of like your signature pieces that you tell your clients that you like to see? Yeah. Like, so I think the first thing is just doing that, that piece asking like, Hey, I'm thinking about doing this. And as long as you've got a reasonable amount of interest and you're going to know what's reasonable based on your audience size and how keen they seem. It's not like your grandma saying, yeah, that sounds nice. You know, like as long as it's, it's people that you actually know are your ideal customers. And then I think jump in and just like literally from that point say, okay, I'm going to do it. I'm, I'm going to do a dirty beta. I I'm looking for, you could either put a number of people or you could say like, I'm looking for a small group of people to work really intimately with me to co-create what I know is going to be an amazing course in blah, whatever your talent and expertise lies in. And you know, you're going to get to co-create it, but you're going to get a lot of extra attention from me along the way because we're, we're in this together and it's going to be awesome. And you get access to the ongoing versions and all of that good stuff. And then you just literally bring them in and you have a bit of a wireframe of a framework, but then you work with them on, you know, I, I always do. And there's a, there's a lot of schools of thought about this, but when I do a dirty beta, I always offer one-on-ones as part of that process, because what I do in the one-on-ones, they're like, yes, I get a one-on-one with Tony. How awesome is that? She never offers one-on-ones, but what I get from them is Tell me all about your fears, your frustrations, your challenges. Tell me all about your dreams, your aspirations. Tell me like what would amazing look like? What would a trans? And I get all of that out of it, which straight away, straight away gives me that. So if you do that with a small tight group, you might be like, oh, one-on-ones, but I'm trying to create a course and leverage my time. Yes, but that's where you can get the real meaty juices from these people. And they feel so special. They are special, but they feel so special because they got you for that one-on-one time. And then you can really create it to serve them. So that's what I love doing. And then you do it and it's dirty. But then from there, you just go and zhuzh it up and you've got your course. And and the hardest launch is always your first launch. After that, it's like easy. You've got the confidence. You've done it once. You know, yeah, you've got to do the marketing and lots of people hate that side of it. But the, the hardest part is getting started and getting it created and not just created and gathering digital dust in your <laughs> in your computer, but created and out there with changing people's lives with it. Okay, I love with what you're saying here about that you always offer a one-to-one when you're betaing it. I was just talking to a client today about a founder's launch that they're planning, and they're talking about doing these group calls and leading them through the program for the first time. They'll never do it this way again, yes, right? So it. they'll never offer, again. yeah, it's their version of one-to-one, right? Yes. And, and they'll lead them through it. They'll get the, all the feedback that you've talked about. They yes. get uh, so much validation. They get the price validation. They get the content, the course validation. 
and think about, so whatever that looks like for you, if it's not a one-to-one, maybe it's the coaching calls, maybe it's the group coching calls, maybe it's uh, office hours or some kind of access to you. And I've even seen it where it's really simple, like when each module drops, kind of at the end of each module, there's like a, a two question survey, like, hey, what was the best thing and what didn't you, you know, so there's so many ways you can do it. But the goal is you need to really learn who your ideal people are and what they really want out of this course and what they're responding to well. Like, what are they like, give me more of this. And what are they like, yeah, you know, fast forward through that section, you know, so that's really helpful. And sometimes live launching also works well because when you're delivering it live the first time and you're kind of, you know, giving the content live, it's not how you want to do it forever because the whole idea of having a course is leveraging your time, but you can see that feedback and have the interaction in the chats where people are either having aha moments. So you're like, I've got to double down on this or they're lost. And you're like, Oh, I have to explain that better. I have to think of a better metaphor or a model or a different way to explain that. Okay. I love that. So, uh, shifting gears a little bit. I, all the time I get folks saying, I don't have time to create a course, right? I know that's one of the biggest objections that comes up, uh, the steps, the time, the layers, do you have tips? I know you do actually. So share some of them, how to ease the transition from going one-on-one to then building a course. Yeah. Look, I think, you know, we've prior to my life in kind of doing, um, you know, online business and marketing, I did life coaching and a big part of what I taught was around time management. And the reality is that we all have the same 24 hours in every day and it's what you do with them that matters most. And if creating a course for you and actually you really want it that bad, like you want that bad, the freedom that a course gives you financially, flexibility a course gives you, the fulfillment a course gives you from changing more lives. If you really want that, if that's really a priority for you, you will make the time to do it. I think a lot of people are in love with the idea of it, but they're too comfortable and safe in their own little safety net to actually do it. And so then it becomes a whole like, you know, they use the excuse of I'm too busy when really the answer is I'm a little scared. And that's like, that's like a subconscious thing. They're not thinking I'm scared, but I'll go and lie to everybody and tell them I'm busy. But usually when you're saying I'm too busy to do something, it's because the fear of failure is stronger than the drive for success. And so you kind of, your brain finds reasons to keep you busy. So That's the first thing I would say. But I also think once you get past that mindset piece and that I don't have enough time and all of that stuff, I would say that I think too many people over bake in their minds like that a course has to be really complicated and it has to be super detailed and it has to give, you know, everybody like the, I don't know, I, I'm, I'm old, but I remember when I was young, like reading those encyclopedias and it was like, you had the whole volume of the encyclopedias and there was like, oh, encyclopedia. yeah, we had the whole volume. <laughs> you had those. Okay. Yeah. Like you're a nerd like me. Okay. Oh, yeah. Pretend, uh, I don't know what your <laughs> right, yes. name was. Yes. Yes. yes exactly. I, so, everyone needed a, everyone needed a set. It's yes. Like, yes. That, that was how you like, knew you were like smart. The, if you the had smart nerdy kids. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And so I feel like sometimes people create a course and they're like, I have to give them like my whole encyclopedia of knowledge around my topic. Yes. When really it's like, no, what's going to help them move forward faster is just like solving one small problem for them. And I'm not against the whole idea of having like a signature course. Um, but I sometimes think like, you know, play a little with some of these kind of like mini courses first to get to help you realize like how easy it is. And in full transparency, this is, you heard it it first here. I've been chatting with my husband about like actually adding some mini courses into my offerings. And I'm like, I think I could do one a week. Like that, I, I literally, I haven't done it yet, but in my mind, I'm like, I think I could do one a week. I have a bunch of topics. I have a process. I have a methodology. I, I think that's feasible. And some people here are probably vomiting a little in their mouth going like, oh my gosh, I could never create a course a week. But it's it's only as complicated and as big as you make it. And you can, you know, the beauty about courses is you get to choose how short, punchy and sharp it is or how long it is. But I can tell you that people's attention span in this day and age is shorter and shorter and shorter. And you've got to really like deliver on exactly what they want and keep them engaged. <laughs> and that's like, that's the key. Yeah, I 100% agree. Uh, a lot of times overcomplication 
is what what holds us back. Uh, so I love that. I love we are totally aligned in that. And you mentioned your hubs. So uh, Michael, so Michael helps you. He's is he the he helps you with the tech back end. Like he helps. I'm I'm maybe oversimplifying what he helps you with your business. What is what does he do? If you're like you're you're the linchpin, Michael. If you're listening, so uh, how do you make it work with your husband? Because listeners know that I work with my husband, Alejandro, aka Alex. And, uh, and sometimes it is wonderful. Like when he gives me tips and he pep talks me on our walks and sometimes it is less than wonderful. So how do you make it work with Michael? Yeah. Like, honestly, I feel like it, I mean, it's hard cause there's not that many comparators. Like there's not many of us that are working with our spouses. Yeah. And so, but I feel like we're pretty lucky. I feel like it works really well. Most of the time, like Michael's really good on the back end stuff. And also, um, in our, in our, like, in a circle, he jumps in in the coaching as well. And he like, he won't say much, like I'll do 80% of the coaching and he'll do 20%. But when he does, it's like mic drop moment. Like he's much more <laughs> deliberative and just nails it. Um, but I think for me, um, it's like the little things, like I have a really good memory. He has a terrible memory. So I'll be like, Hey, do all these things. And then he'll do like a 10th of them. And I'll be so mad <laughs> that he only did a 10th of them. So I think, um, I think it's just like, you've got to have some boundaries around like work and relationship because you know, if you're mad about like something he forgot to do in the business, you don't want to then have like a crappy day at the beach because you're like mad about him forgetting to like send a calendar reminder or something like that. So yeah, no, it's yeah. a fine line, right? That it separation is. and when you're talking business and, and we, we work on that too. We work on that a lot. So, and then we try when Tristan, our eight year old is home, like, okay, business is done for the day, uh, for the two of us, right? Like I can like sneak off into my office, but we do what we do try to make it family focused. But yeah, I know it's tough sometimes. It is, but I look, honestly, I feel really blessed because, you know, before when we were working in corporate, like I'd be traveling, but he couldn't come with me because he was working, like, you know, and now we can literally have that freedom and flexibility together. So. I think the positives like a million times outweigh the negatives, but it's, it's not for everyone. I think it depends on like how you get along and your relationship first. Like if, if your relationship's like not awesome, probably don't like jump in and add business into the mix. Cause that, yeah, true. <laughs> that might be the <laughs> end of it. Yeah. Um, if your relationship's not <laughs> solid, please don't add the business exactly. to the mix. But I, I, but it is nice. Cause I know some entrepreneurs are lonely, right? Or when you're first starting out and trying to put your course together, it can be a very lonely endeavor. So I try to have, I try to have a little perspective sometimes. For sure. And I think like, look, I am so empathetic to those people that don't have someone else in it with them. And I think also, you know, I not, not so much um, my clients, but certainly I hear of other people where their spouses are kind of actively not supportive and that mm -hmm. breaks my heart and think like just how hard it must be for them. But I think entrepreneurship's like, a little bit lonely even when you've got your spouse like i'm i'm sure you can relate i'm like even this morning i was like you don't know how hard it is i have to be the face i have to do everything you know like because he is way more behind the scenes so there's so much stuff that i can't delegate to him or anyone else on my team for that matter because like i can't be like hey i don't feel like putting makeup on to do a reel today can you do it for me oh, like that 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 works. Works. today <laughs> our, our sitter couldn't make it so it's summer it's summer and no camp this week, sitter couldn't make it. So we said, okay, let's go to a friend's house and we'll go to the pool. And I'm on Zoom because I have client calls or and student calls and I right, and I had to put makeup on and <laughs> I literally, you'll, you'll laugh at this, but I had such a chaotic week that last night I had to take a client call in my pajamas with fake tan freshly on me. Like I was oh, like brown and wet. Yes. Because I just like, I had to get that done for an event and I couldn't fit it in any other time. I'm like, you don't had to do it. it. It's so hard being a woman and being it's the same. So like, it's so hard. I know. so hard. Men, if you're listening, there's a lot of women who listen. But if you're listening, just know we love you. But seriously, we take the brunt. We take the brunt. Uh, Tony, I, I did want to touch upon like, we're making course offers on this podcast. Before I let you go, talk to me about. When do you know when you're the right time to do maybe a membership or build a mastermind? Like, when do you know when you're ready for that next other offer or bigger offer? 
Yeah, look, I'm a big believer in focus. And I think sometimes when you have split focus in your business and you're trying to do all the things, you do none of the things particularly well. So I feel like, you know, I'm like, you know, you've got to have like one ideal customer, one like, like traffic source, one launch lever, one offer, like for at least one year. And, and, but if it's not working, if you've done it for a year and you're like, I can't get this off the ground, don't switch, like, you know, figure it out. But if you've done <laughs> yeah. it for a year, if you've done it for a year and it's going really well, then maybe consider yeah. adding something else on. Um, I because I, I just think I would rather people do something really well than like kind of flit around and then, you know, they haven't even got the funnel sorted for their course. And then, then all of a sudden having to create another funnel for their membership and then worry about retention. And then, you know, it's a lot to juggle. Um, so the only <clears throat> exception to the rule I would put is if you're a really established business person, like you kind of got your stuff together, you could launch a course. And at the end, because what's great about memberships versus courses, and I love them both, but what's great about memberships versus courses, courses you sell to people once and then it ends and then they don't keep giving you money. Yeah, But memberships, true, true. Like, they give you money month after month after month. So I quite often like the model of the whole dirty beta launch, but you finish your course and just as your course is ending, you hold a celebration call to celebrate everything that they've achieved and said, hey, I'm thinking about like, creating a membership where I could help create you with, I could help support you with the ongoing implementation of everything you've learned in this course. Is that something you'd be interested in? Cause if it is, then like I would be willing to have some of you come across and do my da- dirty beta membership. And then that's how you can kind of easily get your membership started. Cause you've already got a captive audience. And of course, when everyone finishes a course, they're like, but now I've got to implement it. Now I've got to do this. I've got to do that. Right, so that can be yeah. a really yeah. great way. But I feel like you've got to feel really good about your course and that you've got that nailed and you've got to be ready to kind of do more because that will create more work on the back end. So does that make sense? Yeah. I love that. You're, you're going, you're going back to what we talked about at the beginning of the episode where you're asking them what they want and, and saying like, do you, and it's ongoing. You're right. Like, Hey, I love the, the idea of just having like a payment every month too. Who doesn't love that? Like who doesn't love the subscription idea? Right. But you're right. You have to, you have to ask your audience and, and figure out what do they really need? Is that the next step? I do have, I have accelerator students who go on, like I've got Tracy who's uh, building out her, um, uh, a starter course, I would say that leads into a membership. Like I love that model, but she's in the right place. Like she's, she's actually a grad who came back and she's, you're right. You've got to be in the right place for your business to do that. So if you're listening right now and you're just starting out and you're getting that first course, yeah, just uh, Tony's shaking your head. So give it, give it some time. I love what you're saying. Give it a year. Like you want to maximize that. You want to really know your audience. You want to la- maybe you're live launching it a couple of times. And then I think you're ready for the next offer. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. And I would say as well, like I, I help a lot of people. I, I help people in the course space, but I help a lot of people in the membership space as mm-hmm. well. And you can launch first with a membership, but I always suggest like launching with a course first anyway, because it is that defined period of time. So you don't get the recurring revenue, but you do get the, let me test this out. Let me make sure I really like these people. Let me make sure I really like this experience myself. Let me make sure I'm getting results. And then there's like an end. So if you're like, that was not good. I don't want to do it like that again. You can stop and go, let's judge this and change it before we go into a membership where we're going monthly, monthly, monthly. If you do it and it's awesome, like then you can go on to add a membership. But that's why I'm always like, start with a course. And I, I did that when I first started out, I started with a course because I'm like, I, I want to make sure before I'm like, of course you can get out of a membership. You can cancel it. It's your business. You can do what you want, but it just feels a bit more ongoing and you want to be sure that this is what you want to be doing um, before you go into that ongoing commitment. hundred percent. Yeah. So I love your philosophy around this. Okay. This has been awesome. Where can we learn more about you? If we want to work with you, hit me. Yeah. So I'm pretty easy to find just Tony Beish on socials website. Um, my, um, membership, I've got two, um, one is an invitation only, so you won't find that, but that's the five minute business is the one you'll find. Um, and it's, um, the doors are closed right now, but they're opening very soon. So you can check out more and and learn a lot more about it when the doors open. Okay, great. So check out Tony for more about memberships and content and courses and thanks for coming by. Really appreciate it. No problem. Thank you so much for having me. 
Oh my gosh, the dirty beta. Love it. We do not want it to be pristine <laughs> at all, right? Messy, imperfect progress is exactly what we are looking for. Listen to Tony. And what does it look like if you just went for it? Let me know, send me a message on Instagram at Course Creation Boutique. Let me know how you're taking imperfect action, putting together a dirty beta. I hope you enjoyed our chat. Please join me for next week when I'm gonna have a special workshop. It's a two-parter where I'm gonna be talking about low risk ways to really get your course out there. I've been listening to you guys saying it's scary. There's a lot of fear in putting you and your course out there. So let's talk about a few low risk ways to go for it. We'll talk about that next week. Make sure you subscribe so you don't miss that episode. And if you are seeing impact, if you are taking action with this podcast, I want to know about it. Please leave me a review until next week, go create, be you and be brilliant and get it done.